Good evening, and welcome to Alan's Italy. I was going to say buona sera, welcome to Alan's Italy, but I forgot. How do you like that? I've been getting a lot of pressure lately from friends of mine who have been saying, uh, you got to speak more Italian. This is Rick Hurst. Rick is with me tonight. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Who will be doing um, a very special show tonight on uh, the very famous uh, 20th century sculptor, um, Marino Marini. Um, but first, a couple of things. Let me go to my album here. Whoops, this is really weird. Yeah, people, you know, people have been saying that I should speak more Italian, and I could, you know, I could hold my own, but I certainly can't uh, compete and have conversations with, with people, so that's a problem. But, um, you know, I try, and anyway, it would ruin the mystique, to tell you the truth, because Alan's Italy is based on the fact that a guy like me has been to Italy uh, 20 times over the past 20 years and uh, have had extraordinary experiences, and yet, somehow, has done so without knowing fluent Italian, and indeed, um, can have wonderful experiences without knowing fluent Italian. So. If I learned fluent Italian, it would ruin the whole mystique. So let's just keep it the way it is. So here's the show. It's number 49, believe it or not. And it's The Art of Marino Marini. And uh, number one, I'm doing a library forum, just to remind you, on uh, Monday, January 14th. That's this coming Monday in Saugerties. So those of you who are seeing this uh, live, or perhaps when it begins to repeat on Sunday, and Monday, uh, that I will be doing that library forum, to, pretty much to talk about the book, my second book, uh, Alan's Italy, My Personal Journey. Um, and I'll be showing some, you know, interesting pictures, as I usually do, and talking about the book. And one of the newspapers actually indicated that I'll be doing a reading. I wasn't planning on reading from the book, but then I realized that that might not be a, such a terrible idea, so... I might do that as well. So if you come, I'll be very happy to see you. Um, so this is the book. The book is on sale now, as you know. And um, I push it. If this were, you know, for, for private uh, profit, I wouldn't be pushing it quite so much. I'd be embarrassed. But it is for the studio. And I want to be able to, sometime in early March, uh, hand to the mayor of the town, Jeremy Wilbur, a check that will be given, you know, for the use of the studio. So that's a good reason to buy the book. And uh, the book is now on sale at Gene Termo, which is uh, a store, a lovely store, that's located uh, right in town in Woodstock. And uh, so uh, Gene Termo is at 11 Tinker Street. And if you want to buy the book without having to do it through the internet, then you could just stop by and Rebecca is the proprietor. She's a lovely woman. And she will uh, be happy to show you where the books are located. They're actually right on a table next to a few other books that she sells as well. So um, if you feel like stopping by, that's where they are. And that's pretty much it. So we're going back now to, uh, to the show. We're doing Marino Marini. And uh, Marino Marini um, came to my attention during my trips to Florence over the past several years. And this, of course, is a map of the very center of Florence, known as Centro. And um, just to locate the museum for you, this is a map of, of, of the very center of Florence. And this is where the hotel is. Okay, so this is that hotel that I keep telling you about, Croce di Malta. And this is the Piazza Santa Maria Novella, so when you come out of the hotel, you make a right turn here, you go down to the end of the piazza, and then you make a right, and then you make a left, and La Spada, the restaurant I always talk about, is located right over here on the corner, and as you continue walking down Via della Spada, you come to the Marino Marini um, right over here. And I even have a more detailed, this is where La Spada would be located, right on that street corner. And as you continue down the street, uh, right on the, on the left side is the Marino Marini. It actually looks like a, it, it was a church, correct? Right. It yes. was a church, so there's a little courtyard here. 
and then you'll see that the museum is right over here. So let us begin. This is what the museum looks like. And as you could see, it looked it, it was possibly, you know, a reconverted church. Correct. It is a reconverted church. Um, it's the the ex church of uh, San Pancrazio, whose foundation was about a thousand years ago, 950 AD. Wow. Over the years, uh, over the hundreds of years, it's changed. Uh, it was a convent at one time, it was a monastery at another time. It became several um, incarnations of secular uses. And finally, um, in the 1980s, it was contemplated to turn it into a museum, and, and it's a beautiful conversion. Um, they've kept the nave and a good, um, a good area of the apse, so it has these very lofty soaring spaces to show off the, uh, the art of Marino Marini. All right, so this was established in the 1980s. Was yes. he still alive at the time? No, he was not, uh, he was not alive. Um, this is actually the second Marino Marini Museum. Oh. The first one is in Pistoia. This is... Um, is that right? Yes. Huh. Um, and uh, this one was founded a little later. Both of them are in ex-churches. And together they form the Fondazion, uh, Fondazione Marino Marini, which is um, a foundation devoted uh, entirely to Marino Marini's work and sometimes has shows of other uh, current artists. Right. Well, I, I've never seen that. I usually, we just, we just, I think we've been to this museum two or three times and we've seen only work by, by, uh, by him. But why Pistoia? I'm just curious. Um, Do you know? Marino Marini was born in Pistoia. Oh. Um, and uh, that's uh, where he had his home. He was born in 1901. Pistoia at that time Good was show. a... Yes, there Good he show. is. A picture of Marino rather, Marini. Rather handsome fellow. Um, he was, uh, as I said, he's born in 1901. Uh, just about 40 years after the foundation of modern Italy. So you could see that this was still in their period of turmoil, trying to organize the country. Mm -hmm. um, he, uh, his twin sister, Elie, um, was uh, also an artist and a poet. Um, I believe they came from a fairly well-off family because when they were 16, both of them entered the Accademia de Belle Arti in Florence mm. and uh, as painters. So uh, since that time, um, well, uh, both of them have since died. He died in uh, Vareggio in uh, northern Tuscany in 1980. Mm. Um, but he was born in Pistoia. He was born in Pistoia, mm. which was... a, a really small provincial town at the time, um, a very ancient town, uh, very much connected to the early history of, of Italy uh, and its Etruscan right. foundations. Well, I keep, I keep mentioning it because we're going to be, Laura and I have been invited to dinner there because that's where my friend Lydia's family lives in Pistoia. So we'll be spending the, you know, part of the time on a tour of it, now, you know, it'd be nice to stop by and see what the museum has to offer. Right, I understand it's actually a larger museum. Is that right? Yes. Oh my goodness, I can't wait to see it. I have to ask uh, Lydia about that. Okay, so let's begin with this. Right, and we're beginning with this because uh, Marino's idea of art um, was uh, organized around several concepts. The first one was what they would call Italianità, uh, Italian folklore, uh, Italian folk style, Italian history. Uh, and his, one of his major uh, influences uh, was Etruscan art. This is an example of an Etruscan um, uh, portrait, not a 
portrait, but uh, um, an Apollo uh, from um, the fifth century BC. Wow. And as you can see, it does not really have all of the finished work that um, a Greco-Roman statue would have. It, it still has some features that um, betray an earlier way of looking at humanity. And that's actually what, uh, what uh, Marino Marini wanted to do. He wanted to, as he said, penetrate to the root of what was the beginning of art. So this was one of his great influences, even while he was in school. He had a, a complete classic education, uh, but his, uh, as he uh, got older, he realized that uh, Italian painting and sculpture of the time was uh, ornamental, as he put it, mm -hmm. and decorative. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to have something that was much more meaningful. Right. Okay, show it. Just tell me when to move on. Go on. Okay. This is another example of, uh, as a matter of fact, the very is this the famous piece. The famous piece. Yes, it's it's from I believe it's from Cervetteri, and um, it's a a typical funerary piece, showing a couple on uh, on their bed, and uh, it's assumed that the Etruscans were uh, fairly happy people because this is the way. They like to be shown. Yes. Um, it, so you'll also see that it's not a primitive piece of work, but it's symbolic. Um, you'll see that the smiles, the features, and all the rest of that are not representative of an actual person. They're representative of a people, and of a of a gender, and of a social type. So. This was the this was the aim that Marini had to sort of duplicate that feeling in the 20th century, um, because as he saw uh, the Italian art of the time, uh, except for Medardo Rosso and Arturo Martini, was uh, a decorative art, was a garden art. And so he wanted to return it to the seriousness of what had been in the past. Hmm. You can go on. And these are two of the um, winged horses. Uh, these are um, these are late, probably from the second or third century BC. And you can see they're more naturalistic. Uh, nevertheless, horses have uh, played a big role in Etruscan art, as they did in Greco-Roman art. Um, and the, uh, one of the salient features of it was the, um, the centaur, uh, this, which you see as uh, reproductions all over Italy, little tiny bronze centaurs, literally half man, half horse. Mm -hmm. And this was one of the major influences as well on Marini's art, because the horse, even in his uh, time, was an important element in transportation. Mm. Um, cars were not that um, available. Um, there may have been some, railroads certainly were. Um, the futurists certainly had um, adored the automobile and the airplane, and mm -hmm. um, and so did um, uh, so did some of the uh, cubists in um, in France, but the horse was a, a real figure of power uh, still in uh, Marino's time. How about the wings? What you know? Do you... they're Pegasus horses? Oh, these are so it's uh... these are flying horses. <clears throat> Because they don't really fly. No. Another great influence on him was um, both Tino di Camino and Giovanni Pisano, mm. two uh, pre-Renaissance artists. Uh, what you see here is uh, the pulpit in the uh, Pistoia Cathedral. Mm. Uh, it's a, a great piece by uh, Giovanni Pisano and um, his uh, relatives. Um, it's a, uh, a major uh, sculptural element that shows elements of naturalism 
and also of the Gothic um, non-naturalism. And so um, he was incredibly influenced both by Gothic art and uh, pre-Renaissance art up through Donatello because he said he felt that these also got to the root of what it meant to be great art and meaningful art to, uh, to the general population. I want to bring you to Pistoia with us. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if we can, since it's a complicated story. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, among the portraits that, um, uh, that Marini had. You can see these portraits aren't naturalistic portraits. One of his great themes was to uh, make portraits of all the great and famous people that he had met um, on his trips to, uh, to France, to Germany, uh, to Switzerland, uh, because he felt that uh, the portrait was a mirror of the soul. Mm -hmm. And um, he wanted to recapture that essence that he saw in Etruscan portraits, Etruscan imagery in this. And, and you can see that it's not a finished piece, that the proportions are there, but uh, but it's it's not exactly um, a uh, an exact replica of Mies van der Rohe, and he, he was one of the people that he's met throughout his travels in the twenties, thirties, and forties, fifties um, throughout Europe and, and the United States. So this is this is a fine example. It's still in plaster. Um, the uh, the bronze is in um, Pistoia. Wow. Um, he also had an influence uh, from Tang horses. As I said, the horse was still one of the powerful elements of the time. And uh, Tang horses are <clears throat> really known for the expression of volume and power which you can see above the legs. The hindquarters and the, the front are gigantic. The, the neck is thick. And it's a greater expression of power. Whether this was an actual naturalistic representation of uh, Chinese horses is immaterial. It's because it's trying to show the power of the animal, the power of nature. Mm -hmm. I noticed as soon as I saw this picture, I said, that neck is not, that's not what a, a horse's neck looks like, right? Should I move on? Yes. Okay. Let me write that longer. And um, in 1934, he went to uh, Germany um, uh, as a, in order to take a look at Northern art, uh, especially Gothic art. Mm -hmm. And this is, um, this is also one of the seminal works that he saw this is called the Bamberg Rider. Um, it's a statue that's on the Bamberg Cathedral. It was made around 1230. So it was still during the uh, German Gothic uh, high point. Um, it's probably the first equestrian statue since the Roman Empire. Really? Hmm. Um, and um, you'll notice that uh, the rider is very calm and the horse is very static, but that's actually what attracted Marino to it because uh, for him, the horse stood for power, for nature, uh, for uh, energy, for um, every natural force. And the rider at that time stood for some, for reason and humanity. So you can see that it has um, a, a real, uh, duo there. There's this power in terms of the rider sitting very comfortably on the horse. Mm -hmm. This is the interior of the museum and this is part of the, uh, uh, the nave. So you can see that it has a huge open space. There's also a second floor which has separate rooms. Um, but it gives um, a very big field in which to see some of his very huge sculptures, as you can see, toward the right hand of the, um, of the frame. 
and notice it's an it's an it's another one of these empty museums. There's very very few people who come to this. Yes. And you know you really get a chance to walk around in kind of a relaxed, unhurried manner. Uh, yeah, that's exactly that's, right. It's really a fun place, and it's it's beautifully appointed too. It's not um, it's not outsized. It's uh, very human scaled. Yeah, it's just a beautiful place. Okay, this is one of the other uh, uh, portraits that he did. It's a portrait bust of uh, Henry Moore, um, a sculptor, a uh, very famous English sculptor of the uh, early twentieth and middle twentieth century. Uh, who he had met um, in Forte de Marmi in uh, uh, northern Tuscany during the 1950s. Uh, and they became very good friends. Uh, he always made portraits of friends, um, almost all of which he had given away uh, mm -hmm. to, to those people. So he's made portraits of artists, of dancers, of philosophers, all of which um, have been given away, and these are uh, second copies. I see. Fascinating. Um, this is called L'Imagine, and it's just an image that he's taken from his head, um, trying to simplify the features and almost render them in a way that's sort of Etruscan. Uh, the lips aren't quite the Etruscan smile, but uh, the, um, the head is perhaps little Etruscan. The hair is definitely uh, Roman, mm -hmm. and the style of the shoulders and the way in which the bust is cut off is from the early Renaissance. So this is sort of a combination mm -hmm. of his influences. Was he influenced at all by Verrocchio? Um, I don't know, but he was influenced incredibly by Donatello. Oh, who wasn't? Yeah, uh, who wasn't, uh -huh. right. Okay, moving on. Mm -hmm. uh, this is um, one of the sculptures um, in the museum. It's called Nuatore, which means swimmer. It, it's very, it has a very, um, uh, Martini, Arturo Martini-like feeling, because in the 30s, when, um, uh, 20s and 30s, when he began as an independent artist, Marino's uh, great mentor was Arturo Martini, who was mm -hmm. a very famous sculptor at the time. As a matter of fact, uh, enabled him to get his two major teaching jobs, one at the uh, school at Monza, and one at the Accademia de Belle Arti in Milano. Mm -hmm. So um, you can see that he was influenced by this. It, it's kind of interesting that after um, all of the isms from the early part of the century, uh, Fauvism, Futurism, Cubism, um, uh, Constructivism, that suddenly there was this great change back to uh, representational art. Uh, certainly not universal, but there was a tremendous reaction right after World War I and the Russian Revolution uh, uh, in official circles to denounce modern art as a, a, a revolutionary means of uh, getting rid of the current civilization. Mm -hmm. And so, as a result of that, many, uh, many important writers, um, uh, Di, Di Chirico um, and others, wrote um, a whole series of presentations concerning a return to order, a return not necessarily to the Beaux-Arts tradition of the 19th century, but to focusing uh, on nationalism and uh, the specific meanings of uh, the various peoples involved. So, for example, in France, you had rappel à l'ordre, uh, the return to order. In the United States, you had um, regionalism. Um, in uh, Germany, neue Sachkeit. In, um, and in, in Italy, there was a movement called Valori Plastici, which was a movement back toward traditional themes. Um, why is it called the swimmer? 
It's a good point. I think this was a, um, he's got trunks on. That's number one. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. But yeah, I think it's I also, see. in the attempt to find subjects, they sort of grasped at many things. And I think this was a, um, an excuse to show, <laughs> right. to show a semi-nude uh, human right. being. Okay. So, uh, the swimmer was nothing. Right. And this one is called uh, Bagnante, which means bather. And you can see she has no swimming trunks. Uh, so, uh, why is it bather? It's because it's another excuse for, uh, for a beautifully compact piece of bronze sculpture. Um, in the background, you see another one called Nudo. It's also a sitting. And two of his um, uh, two of his other theme, which are called Pomone, which had a specific reason for being. And you can see more clearly here are three of the Pomonas. Um, uh, Pomona is uh, is an early Roman uh, goddess of fertility and fecundity. Mm -hmm. uh, for him. Uh, the Pomonas represented a happy world, what he called a solar world. That is to say, one that's attracted to the sun and growing. Um, and so you could see their hips are very exaggerated, their thighs are very exaggerated. They seem rather calm, and it's, they're supposed to be unfettered, um, unfettered youth, unfettered uh, development and change, but primarily fertility. And this is um, his feeling about one of the aspects of uh, sunny Italy. That is to say, it was originally an Etruscan uh, goddess, right. mm -hmm. um, a sort of chthonic goddess of the earth, like Demeter, um, who, <clears throat> who represented for him the best aspects of life. And these were done in the 30s. Here's another one. Um, the uh, lack of a head and lack of arms is typical from that period since uh, Rodin, who, um, who championed the use of the fragment. Oftentimes you'll see fragments um, in Greco-Roman art uh, in museums. So he took off on that. Uh, so this was purposeful. He left off. Yeah, it's purposeful. Yeah, because it sort of looks like, you know, some of the things you find, you know, you see in from the ancient ancient times exactly. where, where they're missing pieces. That's correct. And that was the intent? That's to, correct. To, to recreate a, that cla feeling. a classical, yeah. A feeling. Very, very interesting. Now, I see uh, paintings in the background. Yes. Can you talk about them? <clears throat> yes, he started out as a painter. Um, as a matter of fact, for the first uh, 15 years, he was primarily a painter. Um, and then he slowly began to... Uh, to go into sculpture. Mm -hmm. um, was there any reason for that? Um, only because he found that uh, Etruscan sculpture really was um, the most potent way that he could express the concept of uh, Italianità. Right. So this is You'll notice this is more naturalistic. The hips aren't as big, the thighs aren't as big. Um, uh, all of the features are disposed normally. So this is just a nude. And oftentimes he just did those. Right. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is another Pomona. Yeah. And you can see that it has the elements of, uh, on the face, especially of um, an ancient statue. Is this finished? Yes, it's finished. So he wanted it to be just the way it was. That's correct. Wow. Right. And of course, you know, marring this really beautiful uh, picture is that uh, yeah, green, right. green, green sign, green and white sign in yeah, the background, exit. unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Now, <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is interesting. It's called Gentleman on Horseback. Um, it was done in 37, not far after he went to Germany. And um, you can clearly see the debt to the Bamberg rider. Uh, the horseman is still sitting 
is sitting very, very confidently on the horse. The horse is very static and he's, his head is turned to the side, just as you recall the Bamberg Riders uh, head was turned to the side. So this is his interpretation um, pre, how should I say, a pre-Gothic, mm. um, a, a, a deliberate attempt to show some of the uh, bronze versions of horses and riders from the earliest Etruscan period. You notice, uh, unlike the tang horse, the neck is not thick, but the, the, um, the uh, muscles over the front legs are, are very bold. So that gives the sense of being, um, 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 being a powerful element. In fact, it almost looks like the front legs are, are even on the thin side. They are. The They're front. on the thin yeah. side. Uh -huh. Okay, so he's getting into horses. Is he, is he moving into horses now? Yes. Because that's, <clears throat> you know. Okay. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay. After, uh, during World War II, um, his concept of um, what was happening in the world uh, changed radically. Uh, first of all, his um, house and studio were bombed twice in Milan. Mm. And uh, the second bombardment was so great that they just literally had to run away on foot um, uh, from Milan and uh, to um, Brianza in northern Italy uh, near Lake Como. Mm. And there... Um, um, because his wife, uh, Mercedes Petrozini, whom everybody called Marina, um, uh, was, uh, had her family, her family was in uh, the Ticino in Switzerland. She eventually was able to uh, get a, um, a leave in 43 mm -hmm. to go to Switzerland where she stayed, where they both stayed. Um, his view of, of the world, his view of uh, life, and recall, he lived a good chunk of his life up to this time under Mussolini and uh, fascist Italy. He, he considered it actually a very good life, and he did. He had a very good life, mm. and he was able to travel, uh, unlike many, many people, mm -hmm. and he was able to teach art and uh, pretty much say and do whatever he wanted. So for him, life was very, very good. And then he realized that, the, uh, that war was horrendous. Uh, and this is his first expression of the great last theme of his life. Um, the, these are the horses and riders that are no longer comfortable no longer in control. The horse itself is rebelling. Nature itself is rebelling. The rider is barely able to stay on the horse. Reason is being destroyed in the world. And from this point on, his thoughts become darker and darker about the future of mankind. Um, so much so that, as you'll see, the horses become almost like charred and flayed pieces. Mm. Um, in some cases, um, he'll have the riders thrown off the horse. Uh, all, of the, all of nature has rebelled against man. And uh, he saw that because of the persistence of war <clears throat> after World War II, the persistence of conflict, um, the intimation of thermonuclear war, uh, all of this affected him deeply, as it did uh, artists and sculptors all over the world. Uh, as a matter of fact, for 10 or 15 years, after uh, World War II, uh, sculpture had um, showed its effects. It was splintered. It was, um, much of it was steel. Much of it was uh, torn. Um, m much of it, as you can see here, <clears throat> is no longer naturalistic at all, but it's now verging on abstraction. 
As a matter of fact, after World War II, there was this tremendous resurgence of ab abstraction, which had never really disappeared. But this resurgence came about because artists felt that um, the art of the time, the nationalistic art of the 20s and 30s, contributed to the nationalistic movements which led to the war. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so it became, um, among uh, many uh, artists, having naturalistic representation, having objective art became anathema. Um, for Marino, Marini himself, that was never the case, uh, except in his paintings. He was a, he always painted and he was a great lithographic artist and, um, and uh, etcher. Um, all through this time, his sculptures never completely abandoned an image, an objective image, but they became very close, um, very close to that. Wow. So here you can see one yeah. of the, mm -hmm. <clears throat> these, this is called the warrior, guerrero, guerrero. Um, and he's emphasized the angularity of this piece with the color in order to show that the warrior is being knocked down and being defeated. Um, his, uh, almost as if he's being chopped up and his brain has been dissolved. Um, this is his feeling about the war and about what happened to the warriors when they came back. Um, the uh, carnage was great or greater than that of World War I um, and the horrors that the Italians went through were even greater than before. So you can see, um, you can see it in this. I mean, there was a lot of starvation and uh, destruction. This is another one of the warriors at the time. You can see that he's sort of falling down on his, on his forearms. His head is smashed in. It, it's a very, these are huge pieces and they're very, very powerful images. This is a horse from an earlier period, yeah. and you can see it's still the calm horse at the time, and still his admiration for uh, the power of nature and, um, and the fact that nature is in its place, that the cosmos is, uh, everything's right with the cosmos and the world, that was incorporated into this image. Um, not naturalistically, because he didn't want you to see <clears throat> just a horse with all of its features. He wanted you to see the inner idea of the horse, just its expression of um, uh, grandeur and power. What a dichotomy between this yes, and this. It's that, amazing. It, that's it's right. really amazing. <clears throat> this is um, also one of the uh, one of the pieces from the 70s. Um, you can see that the rider is almost non-existent and the horse has been thrown to the ground and nature is being destroyed. We are being destroyed. Um, he, uh, he actually had a lot to say uh, about this. One of the, one of the things that he uh, wrote was, we constructed, we destroyed and a desolate song remained in the world. Mm. So uh, this, is, this is his last theme. And it was never a one note theme. This was his attempt to speak to people, to say that uh, uh, you would better realize that the world is uh, disarrayed. Yeah, you can see the, the rider is barely holding on here. Barely holding on. Huh. <clears throat> he was also, um, as I said, a painter, 
and um, this is uh, called uh, Juggler and Nude. Mm. You'll see a lot of jugglers, dancers, um, uh, actors. <clears throat> if you call, recall the movie La Strada, um, the movie has in it the story of uh, people who were in a traveling circus and a traveling carnival show. And that was uh, all over the world at the time. It was very well known. But even into the 1950s, um, there were traveling circuses and traveling performers, mm -hmm. some good, some bad. And these, these were the, um, this was the entertainment of the village at the time. Mm -hmm. So for him, uh, these paintings were from the 20s and 30s. This was still, this was still the era of a good time. Good period. Is there any significance to the to the blueness of that? <clears throat> you know, the costumes were like the Harlequin costumes. Oh, I didn't know. I, I'm not aware of that. Yeah, they were okay. like Harlequin costumes. I see. And um, these two things showed some of the things that he thought were um, were of primary importance to human beings. The fact that uh, you could have joy and and uh, fecundity right um, these are uh, dancatrici uh, two dancers um, also from the 30s they're um, wonderfully semi-abstract so you can see that even during the period of time when his sculpture was slightly more naturalistic these were somewhat more abstract um, somewhat more um, uh, monochromatic mm -hmm. so uh, this was uh, just a different side to him and on the table um, you'll see copies of many of his um, inches or his etchings uh, woodcuts and lithographs right. mm -hmm. <clears throat> and this is an early horse and rider and a Pomona so this is this is his view of the world prior to World War II, mm -hmm. that everything is quite joyous. And, um, and just, not the primitivism, but the non-naturalism of all of it is supposed to make you feel happy, not concentrate on the yeah. individual features. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that definitely gives a very uplifting view. So, of course, these are horses and riders from the time. Yeah. Um, this is also a painting. Uh, it looks as if the, uh, the rider is jumping onto the horse. Um, mm -hmm. it, uh, th these are uh, from a later period. Um, and right after the war, um, there was a tremendous sense of, um, of release because the carnage was over. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, he has a great um, uh, uh, piece of sculpture in um, the Peggy Guggenheim collection in Venice um, called Angel of the City, which shows a rider on a horse, and the horse is thrusting out its head, and the rider has his hands up, thrown up mm -hmm. um, in tremendous joy. It was made in 47. Is that, are there other paintings or work by uh, Marino Marini in the Peggy Guggenheim? That's the only one that I recall. It's the only one you recall. Mm -hmm. Be going there hopefully soon. <clears throat> and this is one of the last um, horse and rider themes um, from the uh, late 70s um, as, a, as a lithograph. And um, you can see the horses cast up and the rider is falling backwards over the horse. It's very difficult to figure out what's yeah. going on in this. The top of it is the horse's head twisted uh -huh. around. Uh -huh. And then you see the top of the uh, rider's head inside that oval, at the bottom of the oval. Oh, I see. Wow. Gee. That's it. That's it. Thank you very much. That You're very was, welcome. That was incredibly wonderful. Thank so you. So thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, the next show, my next show, which is hopefully next week. Um, as, uh, as my viewers are aware, 
I sometimes do a series of shows on, um, on uh, interviews with people, not people like you, for example, a real Italianophile who has been uh, to Italy many times and spent many, many um, months, years there, but just people who've been there once or twice and who have a very fond recollection. So um, I had quite a few of them. I had about 20 of them, and I've already done two shows on that. And this is part three of that. And I, I have, um, and this is really, you know, this is really it. I've used up all my interviews with people, and I have a few more scheduled for the future. But right now, uh, next week will be uh, the final part of that. I call it Italy in their own words. This is part three, and these are some of uh, my friends that uh, you will be seeing. So I, you know, I hope you tune in next week to the show, and. Uh, until then, buona notte e buona fortuna. Thank you.